Welcome back to Talking Risk. It's a podcast about entrepreneurialism. Every week, Ricky and I have on an entrepreneur or a vendor to entrepreneurs, and they talk about their beginnings and their struggles and their victories, their challenges, their strategies, and and ultimately how they're achieving their legacies. And what we hope to do by this is we hope to further our education and your education in business. And we hope to give you some incentives, some motivation to continue to achieve your own legacies. My name is Eric Reese. I own a law firm called Aspen Legal. You can find that at AspenLawTeam.com. My co-host is Ricky Hall. Ricky? Hi, I'm Ricky Hall, and I'm the founder of Nutrition HQ and Nutrition HQ Franchising. Our guest today is the owner and the CEO of a 50-plus unit chain of haircutting businesses. Brian? Hi, I'm Brian Bo, and I am the owner of The Guy's Place and the Barbershop, a hair salon for men. As Eric mentioned, we've got 50-plus units. We are in 10 different states um, throughout the country. We started in the upper Midwest in the state of Wisconsin in 2005, uh, quickly opened 10 corporate-owned locations, that did very well and based on that we started franchising primarily through organic growth through former customers that came in love the concept uh, wanted to take the concept to another market and we've continued uh, our path of growth and and now we like i said we are located in 10 different states throughout the country Uh, we are as far west as hawaii as far south as florida and we are looking to continue to grow because we've got a, a great model that is uh, very transferable to franchisees. Thanks, Brian. So, so we're going to talk to uh, Brian in detail. Uh, a couple things you're going to note about the studio today. We added uh, Jack Nicholson there uh, smoking a cigar that you'll see. And Ricky, I really like this angle. First of all, my stomach is gone. Right? We we usually use two cameras, and Ricky always likes to start with the camera that makes it look like I'm like 450 pounds. I'm not. I'm close, but not 450. And I really like, uh, number one, my chest looks big, and uh, you see the Aspen Legal T-shirt. So it's looks good. It's really a wonderful, wonderful picture and as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I put the um, no belly fat uh, filter on today. <laughs> Thank you. So that'll be it for this podcast. <laughs> it's, it's a wrap. It. So as everybody knows, if you've listened before, uh, we start with uh, something that we call Hot Topics. Uh, hot, top. hot topics. <laughs> Ricky hit the edge of the button. For hot topics. There we go. It wasn't working. Hot topics are topics that Ricky and I have discussed over the course of the week, usually involving business, but not always, or leadership and management. Um, and uh, first, I'm going to give a shout out to my wife. Um, and <clears throat> the reason why I'm I'm bringing this up is not to brag, even though we're going to be talking about ego as part of the hot topics, but about six months ago, a guy comes to me and says, hey, um, well, I know what it was. We were down at Bike Fest down at the lake, so it would have been October, and uh, he said, oh, I'm buy, uh, I buy bikes all the time and resell them, and I buy high-end bikes, and I said, well, what can you make on a high-end bike through the resale? Oh, I can probably sell it for 150%. I know how to buy them. And uh, I said, well, how long does it take? Um, He said, well, I usually move it in two months, right? And I said, okay, I'm in. I'm convinced, right? So a week later, he shows me a chopper that's featured in a national magazine, all right? And uh, I'm not going to name who it is because he's going through a divorce and he really doesn't want the thing on the record, right, as to what's going on. And so uh, I'm game for that, too. And uh, he said, look, I need uh, X number of dollars, all right? And these were big dollars. This is a chopper featured in a Hot Rod magazine and whatever. And I said to Jill, I said, hey, I'm going to take this money out, give it to this guy. He's going to buy a chopper, and (laughs) he's going to flip it, and we're going to make 150% on the investment, right? And Jill said, 
Okay. All right. And you've met Jill. She's not stupid. The only thing that she's done stupid is marry me. Uh, but um, uh, today we sold that bike. It took longer than two months. We made 150% on the uh, investment. But my point is, is that if you're in business, uh, part of what really helps is a strong support network, whether the network is your friends. Uh, Ricky, you helped me through uh, getting this law firm launched. Yep. Uh, took us a bottle of scotch to do it, but but then I was good to go. Uh, and particularly those who are closer to you, f- family. Uh, that they're everything uh, as far as uh, being supportive of of your entrepreneurial venture. Yeah, I agree. And like for me, you know, well, going in, I actually love helping people. You know, especially in being an entrepreneur, and, and it's just I love it. But you got to have a good soundboard and a good support group, and. I'm blessed to have Tyler and my mom as that support group. Absolutely. the same thing. And to keep you grounded. Yeah, keep you grounded. S- speaking of uh, keeping you grounded, so today we wanted to talk about ego versus self-confidence and self-esteem. And, uh, Ricky, you and I have often talked about humility. The most successful people that we know are very humble uh, and um, that's, I think, almost without exception, at least it is for me. But talk about w- what, what the difference is to you, Ricky, between ego and self-confidence. Oh, self-confidence is, you know, I think I can, get, I think I can make this work. Ego is, I'm the only one that can make this work. Right. And I think you see it a lot in sports. Yeah. And we've been lucky enough that the few guests that we've had, boy, that's self-confidence and not ego. Right. And they're humble. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and so I would define it uh, similarly. I've worked for very egotistical people in the past, and I found that I worked for them uh, not out of respect. I usually was working for them out of fear, fear that somehow their agenda would not align with mine. And ultimately, I'd be, you know, shit canned uh, down the road. Um, that's not the type of leader I certainly uh, aspire to be. Uh, you know, ego in another way is self-confidence without justification. Um, self-confidence, though, is absolutely critical also to leadership. It's, it's critical to selling. Um, when I'm on the phone with a prospect... The reason why they buy nine times out of ten is because they can feel the self-confidence. People want to be around people who are confident. But there's a thin line between that and ego. There is, but there's also there's times when your ego is what gets you out of bed that morning. But you just got to check it. True. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So, um, you know, when we were kind of reading through an article on ego and how to keep it in check and... What I found interesting were the characteristics or the mannerisms that reflect ego. And man, do we see that so much today uh, in society. The blaming of others for mistakes. Um, I mean, that's, that is, I think that defines right now uh, American culture. Is everybody is blaming somebody else for their failures. And I'm not talking about... Uh, you know, the the big stuff. I'm talking about the, the little stuff. It's somebody else's fault from the little stuff to the very big stuff. And I'll tell you this, that no entrepreneur uh, that I've met, met that has had success sits there and constantly talks about uh, how others have done him or her wrong. Well, yeah, the ones that are successful don't. Right. Yeah. It, it, but every entrepreneur has had a situation where they have been treated like shit. We've all got screwed. That's yeah. business. Yeah. Everybody, I mean, that's business. And yeah. you've just been there. And, you know, I signed some bad leases per the guidance of the franchisor, but I signed the leases. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. It was, so, in yeah. the day, it was my fault. Yeah. I made the mistake. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, you know, some of the things that we had read in the article was um, people who are egomaniacs lack the ability to laugh at themselves. 
laugh at the or uh, lack the ability to admit mistakes, play right? the blame game. And and so what's interesting to me is that the people with the biggest ego usually have the lowest self-esteem. And that's one thing that the article missed is that um, ego is usually indicative of no self-esteem. I agree, but one of my favorite things in this was, and I'll read it, it says the ego is like a bully. You can make it powerless if you want to. Sure. Yeah. I thought that was pretty, I mean, think about bully. Right. You know, and that's basically what an ego does. It's right. a bully of you. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we again, we've talked about humility and how it's necessary to lead, uh, but, um, you know, keep your egos in check. And um as you listen to Brian, I'm, I'm sure that you're going to uh, find yet another successful entrepreneur who's learned to keep his ego in check. So, Brian, let's talk about uh, your beginnings, meaning uh, your real beginnings. Where did you grow up? Uh, where did you go to school? That sort of stuff. So I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin, very small town, population of about 500 people, graduated from a high school of 27 kids in my class, 100 total. So um, not your typical situation for many people in in our country, you know, certainly not uh, even a medium sized city. So in the town I grew up with, you knew everybody, you pretty much knew what everybody was doing, you felt safe, you felt um included because it was just a very small, tight-knit community. Um, after um, getting out of high school, I moved or I went to uh, the University of Wisconsin in Green Bay, so home of the Green Bay Packers, um, got an accounting degree there. That school um, was a, well suited for me. It was a smaller school, um, 5,000 students, which from a university perspective is, you know, kind of in the middle. It's, it's not the university of Wisconsin with 30, 40,000 students, but it's not a very small one either. So that gave me some exposure to things that I hadn't seen in the past on a little bit bigger scale, still not a large city by any means. Um, but that's kind of what brought me to where I am today, you know, gave me the, the, uh, foundation, the education and the roots. Um, and it's really, Eric, quite honestly, uh, that's who I am. I'm still kind of a small town guy. Um, I want to get to know people on a personal basis on the level that I, I I knew them growing up where I may not be close friends with you, but I know who you are. If you need help, I'm absolutely there. You know, that's me and my upbringing. Yeah. My guess is that that's going to be a common theme. What Ricky and I were both from small towns, not that small. That's that's pretty doggone small. Mine, Mine's about five hundred. Was it? Yep. M- mine was five thousand. I thought yep. that was small, uh, but um, there, it it will not surprise me. And again, guys, we're going to have some CEOs on, uh, some entrepreneurs that are from big cities and private schools and all the rest. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that idea of roots, um, that idea of probably humility, uh, growing up in. Uh, a small town um, helps, right? Brian is probably the type of person who can talk to anybody, and I think that's a that's a huge strength of growing up in those sort of social settings. Brian, was your school was it close to home? Did you did you stay at school or did you uh, commute? Uh, the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. I stayed at the school. Okay. So it was close enough. It was I could have driven it, um, but I chose to stay there to, quite honestly, get more of the college experience. Um, get drunk. Kind of, get drunk. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> there was some of that, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so an accounting degree. You and I have that in common. I didn't. I didn't even know if you you knew that. So I got an accounting degree at Arizona, and then. I went to work for a fairly large accounting firm. What did you do with the accounting degree? So with my accounting degree, I went for uh, I went to work for a regional um, CPA firm, and I started out um, doing audit and tax, which is kind of unusual when you go into a CPA firm. They they yep. only had one or the other, but because of the size of the firm, we did everything. So I really enjoyed that because it gave me exposure to both. 
Um, ultimately, I did like the tax side of it more than the um, auditing side of it. I like the tax side because uh, the laws are always changing and you can actually, in my opinion, have a positive um, impact on your client by understanding the laws and helping them. Yeah, it's not um, just determining. It's, their tax situation. Yeah, it's right. not just determining what was done. It's some planning aspect to, to figure out Absolutely. what you can do. Yeah. Okay, Be so proactive. you're still a long way from owning a 50-plus unit chain. So where did you go from the accounting firm? So from the accounting firm, I went into um, corporate America, uh, did a stint with a small manufacturing company. Uh, after that, I went to a publicly traded organization, an energy company, um, where I spent many years and started in the accounting department, got to know the energy side of it. So we were, uh, the organization was in the unregulated market. So we were selling natural gas in, and power to end users um, where they had the uh, ability, the option to select a supplier other than the local utility. So there are a number of states in the country that you can do that with. So I really enjoyed that experience. Um, after uh, a few years in the accounting department, I moved to the operations side of the business, specifically on the natural gas side, learned that part of the business at a, at a deeper level, um, was the director of gas operations uh, and oversaw a team of individuals spread out throughout the, uh, not only the United States, but also we had a division in Canada. So I was the leader of these, these, um, the team. Got to travel a lot, uh, Calgary, Houston, oh, uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Chicago. Those were where our primary offices were. So really enjoyed that experience. And then through time, I eventually moved more to the commercial side of the business and um, was working directly with um, customers, brokers, um, internal sales force, and coordinating the uh, sale of natural gas and electricity to residential and small commercial accounts, primarily in the state of Illinois. So that's interesting. So most accountants, I know when I was at Pete Marwick or KPMG, accountants think they know business and they really don't. They know such a very small portion of business, but you really learn business in, in this job, it sounds like, because to go from accounting department to operations, that's a big step. Correct. And the move was all predicated on my desire to learn and ask a lot of questions. And that got me noticed within the organization as, hey, this guy doesn't just want to do accounting. He's asking why we're doing certain things. Why, why are we buying gas at a certain time? Why are we... Um, how does the uh, the time spread on uh, the natural gas curve affect our storage position? So uh, asking the right questions, um, a curious mind helped me move throughout the organization. And the organization that I worked for was wonderful at moving people around and exposing them to areas that they didn't weren't currently in or didn't have the background to currently to necessarily be in but they allowed employees that had an interest to move into other parts of the company that, that interested them and then provided a great network around them to help them learn and succeed in the roles, which really built a very well a diverse um, workforce because people with different backgrounds were in all sorts of different jobs that they wouldn't naturally be there, which means you have a lot of um, different ideas because of the backgrounds that they came from. So it wasn't all accountants sitting in the accounting group. You know, there were accountants on the operations side, there were accountants on the sales side, there were engineers um, that eventually moved into the accounting or the sales side. So just so many different perspectives coming together. It was a great place to, to work and learn. So why the hell did you leave? That sounds like a good job. Well, because eventually my franchise grew to the point that I needed to uh, put more time and energy into that, oh. and um, so it actually allowed me more freedom of, of time, primarily. Okay. So you were doing both. So so when did the franchise begin? 
So the first location opened in 2005. Uh, the first um, franchise location was actually under a licensing agreement that started in 2008, and then we franchised in 2009. Um, initially, it was myself and a partner uh, that were running the franchise together. Um, so the workload was very manageable. So I actually continued to work um, in the energy field up until just a few years ago. And at that point, I bought my uh, former partner out and um, now focus on the franchise and the locations, the salons that I own personally. So let's so let's go back. So at some point, did you find a salon for sale? How did you get into You've got an accounting background. You're working for an energy company. You understand the operations side of it, the retail side of it, the sales side of it, etc. You're managing a number of people on a multinational basis. Why would you choose to get into the salon business? Did, did someone ask you to be an investor or how did that begin? So it was a mutual friend connected me with my former partner. He had the concept. Um, I had the accounting operational background. Um, so we partnered together, came up with, quite honestly, an initial projection to see if we thought that his concept would make sense. And through that relationship, we then basically formed partnerships and continued to work together from 2005 up until 2018. And how did that work? We've talked about partners on the show and the partners knowing their roles and the partners sometimes believing that they are doing the lion's share of the work, even though the other guy might have brought in the money, and but for the money it wouldn't have been possible, etc., how did that work when you were still in the energy business? Let's put it a different way. How did you manage to serve both businesses well during that period? Well, I worked a lot, first and foremost. Um, I guess that, that's really the short answer. Um, but the businesses were very similar, and me and my partner had – very different skill sets, you know, so I was more technical. I, I understood the accounting side of it. I, I understood the legal side of it from the experience that I had received working in the energy industry because for the last five years, I was doing a lot of contracts for the companies where we always had an attorney reviewing them, but I had to review them all myself. So that was a big part of my responsibility. And then at the same time, as I had moved from the accounting um, role into operations and then onto the commercial side, I now understood marketing um, because within the energy industry, we were doing all different kinds of marketing to acquire customers, be it outbound calling, direct mailing, um, working with broker channels, uh, door-to-door sales. So I understood marketing at many different levels um, and through a variety of means to, to get to the customer. Um, where my partner was always a sales and marketing guy, so that came very natural to him. And then uh, he got very heavy onto the operations. So he generally oversaw the operational side of the salons, and he, he was great at refining the business model, the system, understanding what was working, what wasn't working. Uh, it, he was um, great with the employees, um, and I was more on the other side, the franchise sales, the uh, the other aspects of the business, the working with uh, you, the attorneys, getting the fr- disclosure documents out there or filed. Um, so it was a really good split between the two of us because we had um, very complementary skill sets. Yeah, so I'm always fascinated, right, at the the spark, the, the trigger point where something begins. And so so you guys started a salon, right, just a single salon. Correct. It started with one location uh, that opened in 
June of 2005 and very quickly. So we went into this with a very conservative mindset. Mm -hmm. We were hoping that the location could potentially make 25 to $30,000 a year. And within the first year, it became very obvious that, wow, this, this business can do much better than that. Uh, so that then led to the second one opening, um, nine months later and, for, and then, and the second location actually was a, a barn burner essentially compared to even the first location. It was the second location that was opened was profitable in its second month, wow. which is, you know, almost unheard of, Correct. you know, and, and that's, you know, I got to preface that that's not our standard model. I mean, but that one was like, holy cow, the reception from the customer and from our, the employees, the, the individuals that we were hiring was just overwhelming. So that led to an additional eight locations being opened over the course of the next two years. Wow. And then based on that, you know, now all of a sudden the customers start paying us. So the first, all of our first franchisees um, were customers that took the concept to other markets okay, and then in those markets. So it was, it was almost accidental franchising to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, people were saying, Hey, I love this concept. I want to take it. I want my own and, um, help me get there. So we franchised. So with the first salon being successful and the second salon being wildly successful, profitable in its second month, what were you learning about whether it was the location or the price point or the customers or the towns that you were establishing these salons in? I mean, what was unique? It's 2005, so I assume there are other haircutting uh, options out there and not just the, the, you know, the mom and pop barber shops out there by 2005. I'm assuming there's sports clips and and other uh, brands that are national, perhaps even international by now. Uh, but um, what was unique about the brand and the way you guys were doing things that it was so well received? So from a customer standpoint, we kept everything very comfortable and very simple. Um, so when you walk into our salons, if you have to wait, our waiting room has leather chairs in it. We've got um, water, coffee, peanuts available. We've got a big screen TV for um, you to um, you got to cough there, Brian. Watch while you're waiting. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> <That's okay>. um, <laughs> and um, and then when you go back for your service, we've got individual stations so you can have a level of privacy. You can actually have a conversation with your stylist. You can't see the individual next to you because we've you're in an uh, individual station. There's another TV in there. So if you're the guy that just wants to sit down, get his hair cut, zone out and watch TV, it's right there for you. So you've, um, reduced, then, uh, you've reduced anxiety of guys don't, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm the unusual one, but guys don't want to be beautified right guys don't it's not a necessarily a comfortable experience for them so so you've made this a comfortable experience for the customer absolutely yeah i mean that's what it's all about so really the the vision behind this was and i've lived this myself and so i've walked into some national brands mm -hmm. um where they service their full service their men and women uh they're at the medium price point, you know, where a guy like me is going to go quite honestly, mm -hmm. walk in, I need, uh, I have to wait. So now I'm sitting on a hard plastic chair, uh, reading a four month old magazine right. that you know, 500 other guys have handled. Um, and I'm sitting watching a woman get her hair colored and permed and, and living that experience and smell, um, you know, Sure. A child or whatever in, in a chair being served. So it's like, it's just this open concept and I'm not enjoying this experience. So I'm literally there because I need a haircut. It was convenient and I really didn't know where else to go, but didn't enjoy it at all. And that's really what drove everything is let's create a place where you can go, you can enjoy, 
the weight. You can enjoy the the service, uh, delivery, the 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 um, the position you're in while you're getting it, um, and everything is quite honestly just enjoyable, much better than what we had generally been experienced up until that point. Yeah, see, you know, and then to couple on top. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. I was just going to say we've made our our service our our uh, standard service includes uh, a haircut, um, a mustache trim, eyebrow trim, uh, a hair wash uh, with a conditioner, and then we follow that up with um, a shoulder massage, and that's all at the same price, and it's every service. So we oh. we don't have we do have we have some a la carte, and we get a, a beard trim. You can get. Um, some waxing done, some gray blending, but we tr- our haircut service is our competition's high end service. Interesting, it's not just a haircut, and you know that's one of our slogans. It's not just a haircut; it's, it's the whole thing, and it's every time, every service. So, so, and we're going to get to that in a second. But the first thing is um, that comes to mind is I have people in my line of work come to me all the time with. Um, a business that's in a crowded industry, okay? Every industry is crowded, okay? There's very few new things under the sun these days. And um, and one of the questions often is, well, can I get in the pizza business? I mean, pizza is pretty crowded, right? Can I get in the pizza business or can I get in the fitness business or what have you, even though it's a crowded industry? So haircutting um, was a crowded industry by 2005, but it sounded like you guys identified what the competition was not doing for the customer. In other words, and and again, I don't like this. We talked uh, to Tim Burt, a marketing uh, guru on this. You know, you have to identify the customer's pain, right? Right. And, and I, don't, I don't care for that expression, identify their pain. But that sounds like exactly what Brian did. He's like, yeah, I understand this is a crowded field, but there is customer pain that is not being addressed by the competitors. Right. And then, Brian, I think like what you were the example you were giving going into a national chain, I won't go get a haircut in that situation because I and I'll pay more. To go to a place like yours because I want that one-on-one, that privacy, and that service. Right, right. Although although the waxing uh, with Ricky takes a long time, so you'd probably lose money on that too. Yeah. You guys do what? Do you guys do? Do you guys do legs? <laughs> we will try to wax anything for a price. <laughs> All right, so so now so now let's talk about the value proposition because you identified the customer's pain. You said, "Look, we're going to address what guys don't like about going to get a haircut, um, but also you're going to address it on the price." And you know, I'm a big price guy. I I come from an industry that is so grossly overpriced. Um, again. I don't, I spend most of my time wondering how I did things so wrong because everyone must be a multi, multi zillionaire. Okay. They pay $80,000 for a bass boat. They go to Cardinals baseball games all the time and drop $600. It's like, oh, holy smokes. How did you people all get so rich? Okay. I can't afford this. And so I start to think about, when is the end? When do people wise up and say, I'm not going to overspend? A pickup truck today costs $60,000. A pickup truck costs sixty grand. Um, but you obviously addressed price as well. And how did you go about that? How did you analyze, okay, we're going to over-include, arguably, over include the services for one price. How did that analysis go? Well, initially we just wanted to be very competitive in the marketplace. And then what we found over time was that with the proper training, um, our stylist barbers could 
provide this service within, you know, a 20 to 30 minute cycle. There you go. Um, and, and that allowed us then, okay, so if, if you can stay consistently busy and we do have customers that they like everything that we are presenting them, so we are staying busy, if you can do two to two and a half cuts per hour pretty consistently, you can be at a low price, you can pay your staff very well, and you can still uh, take a healthy amount to the bottom line. So that's really where it started is um, we maybe didn't know enough not to be as low priced as we were. It, initially, when the location opened, we were $10 a haircut. And uh, immediately all of the competition is advertising, we fix $10 haircuts. Well, ultimately, we were ended up fixing the $12, $13 haircut in the market at that time because um, we attracted very good staff because they figured out, hey, if I'm willing to go in and and, and work hard, the customers are there. It's it's a great process. I can I can uh, connect with my customer because I've I've got this a little more privacy, right. um, and it just really took off from there. We, we fix ten dollar haircuts. It goes back to ego. I just okay. want to whoever whoever says that I want to punch them in the face and not punch <laughs> them once. I want to punch them multiple times, and then when they fall down, I'm going to kick them. Uh, pretty hard in the you know what's okay we fix ten dollar haircuts hey focus on what you have what can you give to me don't focus on your competition now i'm guilty as charged because i cut my competition down all the time but that's low-hanging fruit other lawyers for god's sakes but um uh but boy that that pisses me off when somebody says we fix well you get what you paid for yeah you're right in our case you do get what you paid for what else you got Hey, hey, Brian, what is some of the um, systems and processes that you, you guys had to figure out how to put in place as you grew? Well, really for us, the biggest growing pain was from a staffing perspective. Um, what are the right levels of staff? What are the right um, management? What's the right management format within the salon? How do you get as much uh, throughput as possible. So it's all about um, the right people, the right managers, and then scheduling um, the customers so that you can utilize efficiency every chair as yep. often as possible. There you go. Yeah, uh, and, when you, and when you look at a station, you look at a, do you, I've owned some salons and we, we look at each station as a source of revenue. Not so much as much as the whole salon, but this station should generate this much in revenue. This makeup room should generate this much in revenue. Is that how you guys look at it also? Well, we don't necessarily look at it. We do look at it at a per station level. We, we pay very close attention to our cuts per hour. Okay. Um, so that's kind of our benchmark. We know where we need to be um, and we work, like I said, very proactively with our stylists. Um, to make sure that we, we've we got a window. We don't want the cuts to be, quite honestly, less than 18 minutes. We prefer that they don't go more than 30 minutes. But we also understand that on the long end, there are individuals that do cut slower. Um, you can coach them and maybe shave a couple of minutes off of that time. No pun but, intended. Uh, it, it, right. <laughs> if, if they're comfortable they have to work within their comfort zone. So quite honestly, we tend to be watching people that are doing too fast of a haircut because are they skipping something? Are they, are they not giving the eyebrow trim? Cutting the um, Cause too little, size. too little, your right, customer feels forward. ripped off. Right. Doesn't feel like he Correct. got the treatment that he deserved. Interesting. Yeah, yep. it is. It's, you know, it's all down to a fish. We've talked about this. Yep. You know, um, system let, process and oh my gosh, the cuts per hour. I love that. Well, let's talk about, and this isn't just for haircutting, guys. This is for medicine. Okay, what happened in medicine? Insurance happened in medicine. All right, and what happened with insurance? Insurance paid less and less and less, and so in medicine, you learned they had to learn to be more efficient. All right. And not necessarily in a good way, although my nurse practitioner is pretty cute, so I don't mind going to the doctor's office. But 
20 years ago, there was no such thing as a nurse practitioner. Now it's all you see, right? And then the doctor pops in his head for two minutes. How you doing? I'm pretty good. Okay, yep. fine. I'm leaving. You know, I mean, and again, it's a little bit more than that, but, but let's not kid ourselves. Those are all processes so that the competitive price can be worthwhile. I mean, you, it has to be, it still has to be profitable. And in, in your industry, Brian, what I see is uh, where my kids go get their hair cut, I see the upsell, right? I see, well, this product would be good for this, or that product will be good for this, or would you like us to do this? And every time they say this, that means an additional charge, right? And so the stylists are trained in the upsell. In your business or the way you conduct the business, it's not really training them in the upsell. It's training them in the efficient delivery of the services. Absolutely. Yep. Interesting. And Eric, you know, from our staff perspective, we take it a step further. Um, so we take walk-ins and appointments. Um, a lot of competition will only do one or the other. Right. Um, we take both. And then we encourage our stylists, uh, barbers, cosmetologists to um, build a request base, which, you know, it can be a slippery slope, but it's a relationship. Absolutely. And the reason we want them to have that request base is because it creates stability and predictability for both of us. If we yep. know the customer is requesting and coming back, um, it's, they can control their income because they can see what's happening if, if they can um, get individuals to book in advance and we can do the same thing. And then the other thing we can do, Eric, is through a, a requested uh, appointment, we can encourage our customers to move to a time that isn't as busy. So if Tom normally comes in at noon for his haircut, uh, which is a busier time you know, because guys are getting yep. in at lunch. If you can come in at 1030 instead or even 11 o'clock, take an early lunch, that works better for us. But he's you know, going to, so but Tom's going to agree to that more quickly if the person requesting that time change he has a personal relationship with. Absolutely. You know, this is, yeah. I represent a big massage chain and, um, so I go for massages, probably not enough, but um, I can't stand it when I've got a massage therapist that now gets me, right, understands, you know, where my problem areas are. That It's always in the back for me because it's stress-related for the most part. Uh, and all of, a sudden, all of a sudden, my therapist is not who I'm getting, right? And it's, it makes me not want to go back, right? Because now I've got to reteach, because that's what you're doing, reteaching the therapist what you need, right? What your uh, concerns are, what your pain is uh, that this person needs to address. And, you know, it's so one of the things that's so cool about this podcast is we talk to so many entrepreneurs, and they're all successful. We need to have some really unsuccessful people on <laughs> seriously that would be fascinating right but the successful people which include everyone we've had on are telling us the same lessons right in different ways mm -hmm. but they're telling us the same lessons for sure so the the uh, i would almost call them technicians the stylists how hard is that to find a decent stylist out there it's very hard currently. Um, quite honestly, most of our locations are understaffed. Um, you know, and just look around, that's it's not exclusive to the hair industry. No. Nope. But there are individuals going to cosmetologists and, and barber schools, uh, so that is an issue. At the same time, there are more locations opening. Um, so it, that is, quite honestly, the hardest part of our business. Uh, we really try hard to take care of our uh, staff. We do a number of things that are generally different than our competition. We give them every other weekend off. Uh, we uh, 
try to make it so that they uh, um, don't work too many nights during the week. Uh, we limit our hours on Sunday and close early on Saturday. And we close at 4 o'clock on Saturday, Saturday in most of our locations. Most of our competition is open till 6, 7, maybe 8 o'clock. So we've done a lot of things to try to attract the best um, and then retain them. Um, and then again, it goes back to letting them develop their own request base. Um, our compensation at a risk, for, at, at a risk, right? Because risk. if they leave you, uh, do you have them sign non competes, or is that a no no in your industry? We do not have them sign yeah. non competes. So um, they can take quite their people. Honestly, initially, we contemplated it, and I mean, you know as well as I do. Generally, you can't prevent somebody from making a living very easily so you know to say uh tell a hairstylist that leaves you that they can't cut hair <laughs> it's going to be very hard to compete well uh, and even if you people. and even if you have a non-compete are you really going to spend money going are you really going to hire your lawyer which in this case is me to go after these people right. and my recommendation as your fiduciary is don't waste don't waste money with me. I right. I would love a new motorcycle, but there's really no reason to waste money with me. I thought me. you just bought one. Uh, oh, no, you sold it. I just <laughs> sold it. Well, and Brian, I think that goes back to where you're talking about creating an environment where you attract the stylists and barbers. They want to stay. And they stay. Yeah. Right. And it's a secure environment. Yeah. All right. Well, but let's... Absolutely. Yeah, let's talk about that uh, a little bit more. So... Um, First of all, hiring is an issue right now. Ricky and I have talked about this. I, I don't know. I don't get it. I honestly have no idea. So I just need right now an additional assistant. That's all I need. And this assistant is going to uh, execute a LinkedIn marketing plan that I already have. I, it's it's a no-brainer, Okay. And I'm offering 15 bucks an hour, okay? And I, okay, roll your eyes, say, oh, big big spender. But I, I can use a college student, okay? This is not rocket science, what I'm asking people to do. I can't find them. I cannot find someone who is interested in working at $15 an hour, which, by the way, is $32,000 a year. I cannot find anyone. Or they're sitting at home collecting thirty two thousand dollars a year right now. It's just bizarre. It's it's bizarre. I, you know, minimum wage again. I'm going to age myself. Minimum wage when I was a kid was two dollars an hour, and I was glad to make it. Right? It's that's that's for another podcast. We're drinking scotch, or at least I am. But um, that's for one where we have more. Or podcast, and we never we never publish it. By the way, guys, <laughs> between hey, us and the fence post. <laughs> hey, Brian, like when um, what is an ideal location when you're looking to award a franchise, or you have somebody looking at a market? What's 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 your sweet spot? What do you guys look for? Well, it's kind of evolved over time. So we are in all different sizes of markets. So we've got. Um, locations in the largest metropolitan, or not the, the largest, but, you know, very nice size, the Twin Cities of Minnesota, um, mm. Milwaukee, the uh, Raleigh-Durham area in North Carolina. So we are in those markets. We do well. Um, but quite honestly, from at least a growth perspective, we have found that our locations tend to grow faster in um, communities that are or areas that are a little bit smaller, and that's in the hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand people um, range, and it may be even smaller than that. We've got some locations in communities that are fifty, sixty thousand. Our smallest one is in a community of fifteen thousand. The difference that we find is, quite honestly, there's a little bit less competition. Niche. Um, this is niche. niche. Brian and I have been talking about this at length, and. We need to figure out how we can market, and you and Brian probably ought to talk, uh, off, you know, offline on mm -hmm. this. Ricky is generating his candidates uh, with grassroots type of marketing efforts, and you know, Brian and I had a conversation with a broker. wasn't very satisfying to me. He uh, focuses on military people, but. Um, 
gave us some fascinating statistics. I'm glad we had the call, Brian. But, you know, uh, military folks have about $150,000 to spend, which eliminates a whole lot of franchise opportunities for them, including Brian's. I mean, you can't you, you can't sell a franchise to someone where we're working night and day sharpening our pencils to figure out how $150,000 is going to work because we got to have them be successful. But this whole idea of we can market and be more successful. Uh, Brian, you've told me that Joplin, Missouri, for example, is is one of your greatest locations. Yeah, it's a very good location. Um, and again, that's a that's a smaller community, 60,000 people. Yep. The um, the franchisee there, my franchisee, is uh, very ingrained in his community, so he knows a lot of people. He's been there for a very long period of time, so it's easy for him to spread word of mouth through friends and uh, social organizations. You know, I mentioned I know that he's very involved with the high school and the, and the high school athletics. Um, you know, so from a guy's haircut marketing perspective, you know, what's a better place than to, you know, be at a high school football game and let people know you're just starting a business and, yep. you know, going to cater to them and their guys, you know? So yeah, that's been a, a great market. I mean, he's also a very good business owner. He's got several other businesses, um, that are similar. So he, uh, similar, but not the same. So he came into it with a great background and then in a really good market. Um, where he was well connected. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, you know, what Brian just said about uh, hometown, right? And I always think of Applebee's, right? Oh, we're your hometown bar and grill. It's like, no, you're not, okay? You're just a big, <laughs> you're a big location with some local pictures or some pictures of some local folks in there. Um, I'm a strong believer in relationships. Uh, in fact, my clients, when I started my own firm, uh, even though I was, as Ricky can attest, scared you know what less, all right, I relied on my relationships. Brian was one of my first clients that it's like I called him, said I'm leaving. He probably liked the 295 <laughs> over the 550 or 600, but at the end, it's like, okay, like your cell phone. It's the same. I know where to reach you. Let's go. That's wrong. Uh, and um, so relationships are uh, clearly important, right? But I'm also a strong believer in when you have a social relationship with someone. And I'm not talking about the, you know, the uh, pampered chef or the uh, what's this uh, very expensive uh Makeup that uh, the ladies are into. Mary Kay. No, not Mary Kay. Kay. Ro uh, Roden Fields, okay? I'm not talking about these, uh, not pyramid schemes, whatever they are, multi level marketing uh, programs. I'm not talking about that. When you have a personal relationship with someone like Brian's guy has in Joplin, because he's well known in the community, to honestly just say, look, I have a business and I would really appreciate if you would just check it out. Dude, that's that's difficult to not to not at least check it out. Now, if he screws it up, that's on him, but he's going to get the opportunity to screw it up. Well, I had a conversation yesterday with the guy and he asked me what makes a good franchisee and I was like somebody that's ingrained in their market yep. and they're an ambassador of their market ambassador. everywhere they turn yep. it's about Jeremy yeah. it's about Tyler it's about Brian Yeah, and that's what you want to be you want to be the ambassador of your community yeah it's interesting that you say that because on Facebook and again I'm, I'm you know 58 I'm, I'm just learning how to use Facebook at first not, not from a social perspective, but learning how to use it to get the word out. So uh, I posted something about our podcast and about Nutrition HQ in, in one of my posts, okay? And someone who knew you, I guess, I, I don't think they knew me, okay, said, oh, 
Tyler is great. Okay, well, Tyler is Ricky's son oh, wow. in Quincy, right? Yep. And so they didn't, they're not even buying the brand. They don't give a rat's ass about Nutrition HQ. They're buying Tyler. Absolutely. Right? And so relationships are so critically important, and that's so different than what we might hear from Brian's competitors. We fix a $10 haircut. Yeah, don't. Don't come near me, dude. You're going to get hurt. Okay, but um, but that's so different because their model is upsell, 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 sell this, sell this, sell this, sell this. And Brian is saying establish a relationship, a rapport with your customer. You know, that's it's everything yep. for sure. All right. Yeah, well, and Eric, I'll take that a step further and, and it's, Establish that relationship and rapport with your staff also. Uh, absolutely. That, that's, that, that is yeah. really our biggest, um, I don't want to call it a secret, but that is a, that's what we try to do. And we, everything is very transparent mm-hmm. um, from us to our staff, you know, our, how we compensate them. Um, yes, they are on a commission, but that commission, it's not tiered. If you, for every haircut you do, you're going to get X. And right. it's very clear, as opposed to others that are quite okay. honestly playing some games. Okay. You know, so, you know, we try to keep it very simple for the customer S- and for the staff. So the commission is structured for the efficiency. The more efficient you are, the more you're going to make. Correct. But don't be too uh, efficient. Just clear yeah. on that is no, if okay, cool. every haircut you do is at the same commission rate so that it's not like you I have gotcha. to do 10 to get to yeah. the highest level if you do one you're going to make x on that cut if you do 10 you're going to make x on all 10 of them so that's very simple from that perspective good good well brian i knew i knew i mean so much uh business lessons so many great strategies uh you've conveyed to us today and and you really echoed what other entrepreneurs so far have have told us, and that's no no great surprise because you guys are the same. You're you're successful, and you're humble. Now I'm going to ask you the unfair question, but I ask it of everyone: if if you had to tell someone, and and let's not just focus on your industry, let's focus on the guy who's in corporate America or the gal who's working a job that wishes she wasn't if you had to tell someone uh that is thinking about going out and starting their own business whether it's a a business that they're going to run while they're still working for their corporate master for lack of a better term or uh, a business that they intend to you know blow up and and take on a national level or a multinational level What are some things that you wish that were told to you at the beginning um, that that you would convey to to that sort of person? Well, the biggest thing would be do it sooner than later if you are at all interested. Believe in yourself. So, again, back to the the self-confidence. If you are interested in this, if you're willing to put the time and the energy into it and you're honest with yourself, enough to say it's probably not going to be easy, but if I work really hard at it, I know I can do this. I would say do it sooner than later. Go into it eyes wide open, though, that small businesses uh, fail um, without a doubt. Uh, So there is risk associated with it, but there's only one way to find out, and the sooner you do it, the sooner you truly can control your life and what is important to you. If money is important to you, you, you can control that because you can keep growing your business. If time is important to you, you can, by owning your own business and running it in a manner that allows you flexibility and freedom, you can have more time and not sacrifice on the other end. So I think that's really one of the biggest things yeah. that I would I that I would say to people is there's, you can't start it soon enough if this is what you think you want to do. Yep, and if you do fail, get up and do it again um, because – correct. I've had some failures in in the past, and you know, right now life is 
pretty good for sure. Well, one of my favorite things was Robert Kiyosaki was being interviewed on a radio show, and somebody called in and goes, "Well, nine out of ten businesses fail. What do you say about that?" He goes, "Well, I guess you better plan on opening ten businesses because one of them's going to hit." That's funny, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, Brian, it's it's been a, a pleasure. Did you enjoy yourself? Was this fun? I did. This was a good conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Brian, what's the best way to get a hold of you or find you if anybody has interest? Uh, the best way is to uh, look us up online, uh, www.theguysplace.com. And you can check our website out. My phone number is listed on on the website, and we do have an email for listed for additional information for anybody that would uh, like to have a conversation so uh it's time to do it for brian's business and you if you're in a secondary or third market or whatever they call them those people that say we fix ten dollar haircuts uh that's where you're going to make your hay so um contact brian and obviously he's got it figured out now if ricky can hit the right button for our uh for our music we will talk to you next week. Brian, thanks so much. It's hey, been, Brian, thanks it's so been awesome. Thanks for having me. Nice talking with you.